up, everybody? I'm Jen. I'm with Unicorn Riot here today in January 2018. I'm here to bring you a live studio interview with um, some Defend J20 folks. We're going to have Naya, who is a supporter of um, the J20 folks, everybody that was arrested in um, during the inauguration of Donald Trump into presidency. And then we also have uh, defendant Olivia that's going to be uh, joining us here today in the studio. Uh, we have interviewed her once before. That was in, I think, June of 2017 when we were in Chicago covering the People's Summit. Um, if you navigate to the description of this live stream event, you can find that video there as well as a link to our website. Uh, it's one of the most recent articles that we put up about the J20 trials. Um, six people um, had their charges cleared. So you can navigate to that article and you can see all the other coverage that we did of um, the trials. And also um, some of our coverage from Minneapolis and from Denver too on the 20th, if you go to our website. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us here today in the studio. And I think we're going to bring on our interviewees now. Yeah, they are. Hey, welcome. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, so, hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm a J20 defendant uh, currently awaiting trial. My trial starts in March and a uh, Chicago resident. Uh, I'm Nyla. I'm an organizer in Chicago and I am one of the supporters for the J20 defendants. Nice. Welcome. I'm glad we have a good connection. Um, it's <laughs> nice to be able to sit down and talk with you. Cool. Um, I guess first I wanted to just kind of open it up to both of you, um, I guess specifically Olivia, um, to like give kind of a rundown for folks that are just tuning in um, to this broadcast, but also to the, to the big story in general, you know, like what's what's going on. Um, we interviewed you back in June and we got some um, great footage from you then too. But yeah, just anything that you want to say to bring people into the conversation that are watching now? Yeah, so um, for those who don't know, which hopefully isn't many people, uh, during the inauguration of Donald Trump, there were a lot of protests through the course of the week and during an anti-fascist, anti-capitalist march uh, 230 plus people were indiscriminately kettled and mass arrested, basically just like swept up on the street um, and then um, proceeded to be charged with felonies. Uh, initially, it was one felony charge for rioting, uh, but then the government charged us with multiple felonies um, conveniently after they offered a bunch of plea deals. Uh, and then through the course of the case, uh, so there are various rulings have happened. So we initially had eight felonies uh, and a misdemeanor charge on top of that. But due to some rulings uh, and motions that have gone through the court process during this time, we now have uh, six felonies and two misdemeanor charges. So now we're all looking at uh, a maximum sentence of 60 years instead of 75, which is an improvement, uh, but hopefully we could get more charges dropped and ultimately we'd like to get all the charges dropped. Um, and so our first trial just happened with six defendants and uh, the case went really well. We got acquittals for all six defendants, which is 42 charges, I believe, total that got, um, got not guilty convictions. So those people are now free to go, which is super exciting and a really good sign. Um, but also we should recognize that this is only uh, a very small percentage of the people who still have to go to trial. Um, so there's still a lot more fighting to do for sure. Um, myself, my trial's coming up soon. So I'm trying to prepare for that um, and get ready for the other trials as well. Nice. Thank you for the um, update on all that. And uh, Naya, when, when did you start um, supporting these folks or like how did you get involved in Defend J20 Resistance? I think um, the United States has seen a broad coalition of people that have been united to object to a new like a neo-fascist administration taking over the government. So a ton of people were out on the streets whether or not they were 
in Washington, D.C. Uh, to protest the inauguration on January 20th. I think my participation comes from my objection to what we knew would be an authoritarian enforcement of that state, and we're seeing that to come. And so when we saw that there were people who were being indiscriminately picked up in Washington, D.C. for practicing um, you know, their abilities to protest, uh, people across the country, like myself, knew that we had to support those people who were going out to D.C. and that we have uh, things that we can do both at the national and local level. So I've been participating in, as far as I can, uh, local support efforts. And uh, what does that look like in Chicago? So for Chicago, we know that um, people, like the purpose of this trial is to break the spirits of the people who are being prosecuted and drain the resources, drain them individually and drain them collectively. So one thing that's very expensive is having to fly back and forth to go to all these very lengthy administrative hearings um, when you're flying across the country. So one, monetary support is really important. Getting the word out is incredibly important. Interviews like this, making sure that our presence is at um, events around Chicago, making sure that residents know this is what federal funding is going towards to um, prosecute people from across the country that they don't have any like true evidence against. Um, and so for us, it's the combination of those two. Yeah, and I think um, additionally, okay. um, uh, so there's five defendants in Chicago, including myself. Uh, and something that's interesting is that we actually didn't know each other before this happened. So a lot of the sort of work we've done in Chicago is actually just like working together and bonding and then like starting to organize with each other. Uh, whereas previously, like we didn't have any knowledge of each other or relationship to each other. Hmm. I understand. Oh. I was going to say, I understand there's like um, a media working group for the J20 defendants. And like, are both of you a part of that media working group? Um, I am. I'm a supporter, but I'm not involved in the media efforts uh, as a broad co coalition. Cool. Um, just curious. Uh, I was wondering something you just said. I wonder if you have a comment on. Um, there's this fellow defendant, Carlo Piantini, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, he was saying in this article that like the goal here is not to convict people to like 75 years in prison, which is like a threat that's looming over some people's heads, but quote, to extract as many guilty pleas as possible uh, while sending a clear message to potential protesters that the consequences of opposition will be grave. Um, I wondered if, like, what did you, what would you have to say um, in response to that, or going off of that? So I'll say that's a totally accurate depiction of what's happening here, and broadly in what is called done in the so-called criminal justice system we have in the U.S. Um, anytime that people are swept up into these systems, uh, it's supposed to be a stress on their financial resources, on their time, on their spirit. Prosecutors have an enormous amount of authority. They have an enormous amount of flexibility in what they're done, uh, what they're doing to these citizens and any people. Um, and their career advancement hinges on getting as many guilty pleas as possible, not in establishing justice or order or any of the so-called principles they take an oath to live by or to work by. And I would just add that the government doesn't necessarily need to get convictions in order to reach their goals here. Um, it does like help their uh, career and help them advance in their career, but also uh, a lot of the punishment really is the pretrial. Um, it drains your resources, it's really hard on your emotional spirit. Um, a lot of us just can't participate in activism in the way that we want to for what's basically been a year and could be a year plus, could be several years even before all these trials are seen. And during that time, we're not allowed to be out on the streets or doing the type of direct action uh, that is really necessary right now. And in that way, they're already pretty successful. And I believe that's why mass arrests are so common because if you sweep a bunch of people up, all those people, that could be a huge chunk of a march. And those people are no longer cap like able 
to march anymore for fear of arrest. And when facing these really hefty charges, that's enough to dissuade some people from activism. And so even by just arresting this so many people, even if they don't get convictions, they're already taking a huge bite out of activist communities. And I was thinking about that too, um, just the act of, at that protest march, um, when so many people were kettled, like when, when that does happen, you know, when a bunch of people are swept up right away, then um, people around them who aren't being swept up, who are also part of the protest, but aren't being targeted right then, like they see what's happening and that can, you know, have a deterring effect for them to continue being there. They might think that they would be next literally right then. Um, yeah. Um it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, recently a new lawsuit was uh, launched against MPD in addition to the ACL lawsuit that's already uh, against them stemming from this day. Um, it's from a mother whose really young son uh, was pepper sprayed by police while they were across the street watching us be kettled. And there's other footage of, as well of bystanders who were just around where we were kettled, who were watching us and who were chanting for us to be let go and asking the police to let us go. There's a lot of different footage of the police violently and without provocation attacking those people. Um, so even being a bystander there beyond just seeing the visual of seeing this mass arrest, um, a lot of them actually directly suffered um, harm due to the police actions against them. Yeah, there were part part of the original indictment. There's this article that um, we wrote that came out in July. We included that like the indictment alleges that a hundred thousand dollars worth of property was destroyed. But then also this like local government of DC has like allocated a hundred at the time had allocated hundred fifty thousand dollars to officially and get investigate the misconduct of police on that day. Which I think is interesting. Yeah, the um, the damage that the a uh, hundred thousand dollar damage is actually mostly made up by the limo fire, which didn't actually happen until after we arrested. So the amount of damage that they're saying is done is actually much lower uh, than that number. So if you take like this small number uh, of damage charges that they're alleging that we did compared to how much money they're spending on the investigation into the police actions that day, not to mention the like thousands and thousands of dollars that they're wasting of taxpayers' dollars to prosecute us. Um, it's like completely outweighed by the uh, much smaller number of whatever they're alleging was actually done by us. It it's uh, watching how this is unfolding, having heard the testimony from the commander, the police commander who was in charge, who gave the orders that day to arrest people who had written the standard operating procedures, which he disregarded because he was he was alleging that um, he identified everything as a riot, not a protest. Um, what was I just going to say? Sorry. Uh, yeah, dur during this time, uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I totally just forgot what I was going to ask you. <laughs> but I mean, no I think what you're pointing out is incredibly correct. I think that we see a lot of metropolitan police departments and police departments across the United States put out these, um, these manuals that are meant to abide by the laws that are in that area. They're meant to provide guidance for how assemblies are to be policed. And what, they, what we see time and time again is that police departments don't follow these manuals, that they, you could be the author of it them, yourself, you could be the person who knows it inside and out, and yet when you go and you hit the streets, you see all of the individuals who are outside as disposable or inherently uh, arrestable and abusable. And so what we saw in Washington, D.C. is also a reflection of what police do across this country, that certain people are seen as defenseless against the police and that they can get away with what they want to get away with. And part of the reason that people like me are, J are supporters of the J20 is to indicate 
to the state, the law enforcement and the prosecution that they cannot do this. There are people who are watching it. Our eyes are on it and we're going to be dedicated to making sure that this does not continue and that anytime there's a mass of people who are out on the street, whether or not they're protesting, whether or not they're just citizens of their area or are residents of their area, that this is not going to be a way that we will allow ourselves to be policed, especially with the next three years continuing of this administration. So yeah, I guess I want to, do you want to say more about like, allowing ourselves to be policed in this way like the the standard operating procedures were written so that police would have a guide in how to interact with people who are expressing their first amendment rights and that's I, that's what i was going to say before i'm sorry but um yeah this like it's it seems like it, it could be that they don't know how to interact with so many people who are out so like a strategy employed or a tactic employed by them is just arresting everyone and then figuring it out later so, yeah, what do you have to say about that? I mean, the irony of manuals and instructions that are put out by police departments is they're not meant to protect the citizens or the residents or the people who are out on the streets. These manuals are ways to bypass any legal liability that they will bear for their abusive practices. So they can post hoc, look at what they do, go into their manual and somehow justify their actions as it falling in line with what they had written. What we see time and time again is despite these manuals and despite their so-called training, they're not fit to interact with any person, let alone mass assemblies. And I think it's worth pointing out that the uh, most recent, recent standard operating procedures were written by DeVille himself along with others in response to a series of uh, large mass arrests that were illegal that uh, resulted in several million dollar lawsuits in DC. Um, and so uh, this is something we see uh, time and time again as well is these small little steps that are basically meant to placate populations when they are demanding social change, specifically within the police force. Um, here in Chicago, there's a, a huge issue with police violence. Um, it's number three in the country, I believe, for rates and incidences of police violence. Um, and so whenever something like that happens here, they've set up a task force afterwards. And the task force is supposed to be like independent. And uh, but those task force inevitably are always um, ran by other police officers. So unsurprisingly, they never find the police officers guilty. And similarly, in D.C., there is an investigation that is being launched into right now into the police behavior during and their use of force during the inauguration. But while we're happy to see that investigation happen and we definitely want to like pursue that and support that, right now the, uh, the people who are set to run the investigation are the police foundation, which are a huge, huge like police organization that is very overtly pro-police and has a history of finding the police like completely innocent of any wrongdoing and like are clearly a biased organization yet they're the ones that are supposed to investigate the police um and i just think it's worth pointing out like all the different ways in the justice system that allow for this behavior to continue and like actively discourage its um uh changing for the better <clears throat> I think originally uh, in this uh, live interview with Olivia and Naya, we were hoping to get some uh, live stream participation or like comments from people who are watching this live, but we're having a little bit of connection issues right now. So we cannot be doing that, unfortunately, during this interview. Um, but I guess I wanted to open it up to uh, Olivia and Naya, if you wanted to say anything additionally now, after we've like had me asking you a few questions, do you want to say anything in, um, in general about like where things are at or like moving forward, uh, what you would like viewers to know or pay attention to? Um, so one thing that I think is a big takeaway from this entire process is the um, the way that particular forces are working together. So we see that the MPD, the Chicago Metropolitan Police Department, is working with the prosecutors who are um, taking out all of this authoritarian enforcement out on people who are on the streets. Um, and then all of that is 
further reinforced by the fact that alt-right sources such as Project Veritas were being cited in the case itself. So it really pull, put, it pulls back the veil on what these court proceedings are actually trying to do, who is actually meant to be policed, and whose protection um, the U.S. federal government under this administration is actually concerned about. Uh, this is part of a broader pattern. You can see that any time a new administration takes over, um, federal departments like the Department of Justice, which are supposed to be the oversight mechanism for law enforcement at large, shift their strategic priorities. So um, this links right back to Chicago. So as soon as um, the Laquan McDonald video was released in Chicago, the, the Chicago Police Department started scrambling because they knew that a Department of Justice um, that would be enforcing um, police oversight would enter into a consent decree and then make sure that the policing that is currently happening in Chicago does not continue. Instead, what we have is a Jeff Sessions-led Department of Justice that has decided that its orientation is going to be to continue flexing that force in the nation's capital to make sure that it sends a message to the rest of the country that their emphasis is not on what kind of abuses that the police is going to enact on people abuses that include the usage of chemical weapons such as pepper spray indiscriminately into crowds that include um, vulnerable people, people with health conditions, and not a concern over things like police brutality, the shootings of unarmed um, citizens by the police department itself. And so this entire case highlights that if people are putting their faith into um, law enforcement as somehow mediating um, the kind of violence that the state enacts to us, it's not going to happen. The only way that we have to resist is people who are kettled indiscriminately in Washington, D.C., the people who are doing actions of popular resistance in their you know, localities to make sure that we aren't um, ceding any of our um, autonomy or our expectations and hoping that it's somehow going to be flowing from a government that's ultimately being led by an openly racist, white supremacist president and administration. And just in that vein of things as well, um, the uh, overseeing uh, attorney right now is actually directly from Trump's transition team. Um, so it's kind of like no surprise that these charges that are extremely overblown and have been from the jump are being relentlessly pursued. Um, given the recent acquittals of the six defendants who just went to trial, uh, they had similar cases to pretty much everyone in the case uh, as well as I can tell from trial. Um, and so we would expect the prosecutor now seeing that the jury's not buying what they're selling, so to speak, that these charges would be dropped. But instead, like almost uh, government that's I, the same day, I think they uh, basically said they were going to pursue all of these charges against everyone, uh, which again, I think goes to the point of um, them trying to like, take away from our social movements by taking us sort of out of the picture and draining our resources. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that we're also not the only activist on trial right now or facing charges all over the country and every single place there are activists who are facing charges, many of them also felony charges. And these are all overblown and um, some of them relate to mass arrest as well, such as in St. Louis uh, and um, you know, so it's not just us. It's like a broader picture of uh, protest being repressed by the state. Um, and this is such an important time for protest, given the bigoted nature of the Trump administration and all of the uh, policies that they have enacted recently uh, that have harmed people. Like now is the time when protest is most important. And so it's no surprise that their administration is pushing back on that and trying to criminalize dissent as much as they can in order to keep uh, resistance at a low so that way they can act however they want without any fear of repercussions. Another thing that I'd like to add to it is, you know, the first set of the first set of trials that ended with acquittals is unabashedly a victory for people who are um, supporting everyone who was um, picked up on J20. But that doesn't mean that this is over. There's 180 plus to go, um, that these cases are going to continue, that each individual who gets swept up in these criminal proceedings have to do this over and over again. At the same time, uh, the attorneys performance at these trials is 
kind of embarrassing for them. They know that they don't have evidence that's required to get the indictment, and yet they're being forced to carry on these cases as a political ploy, and they're they're failing. It's a you know at the point where the judge has to interrupt your final arguments as the prosecution to tell you that your own definition of um, the standard of uh, guilt is wrong. Um, it shows how weak their case is, how little they have to go off of, and the fact that even the attorneys in all likelihood have no real investment uh, get about winning this in, in terms of trying to enforce the law. These are career prosecutors. Their job is to get guilty um, guilty pleas or convictions however they can, regardless of whether or not the cases are substantiated. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible practice that they're trying to employ. And it definitely shows that the victories that have been coming and will hopefully continue to happen are a combination of the fact that they don't have a case on them and on the groundswell, there's support for the people who are being prosecuted. I think it's important to note that the law is selectively enforced um, and anybody who studies social movements or the history of the law, this is extremely obvious uh, because the criminal justice system is basically just an extension of the Jim Crow system. Um, but for instance, uh, you know, a bunch of people protesting rounded up to over 230 of them facing decades upon decades in jail for many of us, like possibly the rest of our life. Meanwhile, the same weekend we were arrested in D.C., there was a really wealthy white man who got arrested for sexually assaulting uh, hotel maids, and yet he got a $50 fine and got to walk out free, whereas we're all still locked in this process a year later and facing charges, um, you know, and I mean, Roy Moore still ran for his seat, like it's an incredible bias in this country to see how the law is used against protester, but how easily they go against, um, you know, uh, people who sexually assault people, people who actually hurt people. Um, and like, for instance, like the white supremacist in Charlottesville, like very few people there were actually targeted or arrested by the police because of their actions, despite it being overtly a hate march that was extremely violent and mob-like to people. Everyone there basically went home free, whereas like a couple, like some vandalism allegedly occurs while we're marching and we're all like locked into this system. And I think it really just goes to show how like the law is selectively enforced, but also selectively structured in ways to criminalize activities that are a threat to the overarching power structures in this country. Olivia and Naya, thank you so much for being here with us during this live interview and sharing your perspectives. It's like been really nice to talk with you. And I want to thank you once more for joining us here in the studio today. And I want to wish you luck to Olivia um, in March uh, in, in the coming months, too. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Of course. So I want to I want to just say hey thank you for joining us today bearing with us when we were having some connection problems initially it's always fun trying to go live but we are here today we're here in Minneapolis actually um, doing this studio interview that was Olivia and Naya they were out in Chicago uh, Olivia is a defendant in the third wave of trials against people who were arrested protesting um, on the day of the inauguration of President Trump. Um, and then Naya is a supporter uh, involved in J20 resistance and um, within, the, within the broader community there of the coalition of resistance. Um, we are Unicorn Riot. We are your alternative media and we are volunteer operated and we are supported by donations from viewers like you. So if you like what you have seen here today, uh, please consider becoming a supporter in some way. You can make a one-time donation to us, or you can become like a micro, micro mini support, supporter, uh, making little donations to us every month to keep us uh, afloat here and to have us continue providing this media for you. Um, please go to our website, too, to check out all of the coverage that we have provided about J20. You can use the search bar on the website, search J20, Bam, all the articles will come up that uh, are connected to 
uh, reporting on these trials. So yeah, again, thank you for joining us. I'm Jen here with Unicorn Riot. And yeah, stay tuned to this story. We will keep bringing you updates as we know them.